Good morning. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can make this work. Uh, which one first? Let's do this. And go and work. Let's see, I don't know if this I think that might be slow. How'd you feel? You watched it. <coughs> Correct, because and the neurobot mirror neurons. I show you that because the mirror neurons. And even shifting to some extent, right? Well, that's what shifting is. Thank you for that's exactly what shifting is. If you want to, I use that term in a more negative way. Shifting is when we create in others our negative states that we don't own. We want them to own it, and in their owning it, we don't feel so alone, we feel better. But basically, mirror shifting, the process of shifting is based on mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are, never mind the neurobiological substrate of empathy, they are also the neurobiological substrate of civilization. I remember I talked about Ramanachik, Ra, Rama, Ramachandran, this wonderful UCSD prof. <laughs> He has a wonderful uh, TED talk on mirror neurons, including how they're the base of civilization. Because in mirroring what others do, we learn immediately. And that allowed for tremendous advancements. And the, the substrate of imitation, well, we'll get to that in a moment, because I want to say that. But that, it made an enormous difference. It's fascinating. By the way, speaking of Ram, again, I told you Ram Chandran worked with amputees and how he figured out the mappings. Do you know that if? See, if I do this, that part of you that scratches is now activated in your brain even though you're not scratching, okay? Well, here's what's really trippy. If I numbed your left arm, okay? Your left arm now is numb, and I do this, you will actually feel this, my scratching. So the reason we are separated is by the biofeedback that says, the neurofeedbacks that say, this is my arm. I feel it. I don't feel this. If we don't feel our arm, we are one. Isn't that cool? We are one. It's just so cool. Okay, so I want to show you that. Then I want to show you this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need this to go back. Hang on. Wait, wait. Shh, sorry. This thing's really. Do you know what that's from, by the way? It's a series called Touch, um, uh, Keith Hurst Sutherland. I don't know how well you could hear because it was a little blurry. What's the singular, fundamental, most important human drive? Connection. For connection. That's what he was really talking about. And even says at one point, I need to connect. It's for connection. It's by far. Did you watch the Academy Awards? Of course, most. Okay. So, of course, everybody thanks their mom or dad in heaven or otherwise. And, of course, they try not to forget their wives. Honey, I love you. I love you. Honey, I, I mentioned I love you. 
is what matters is who we're connected to. Yes? It's so funny because last week we talked about it, and I was working with a client yesterday mm -hmm. out of an inpatient hospital, and she was pretty much talking to me about how she was pretty much in the gang world, and she's kind of banned from certain cities, and has done a really a lot of bad things. And I was like, well, what changed? And she said meeting her partner and being loved for the very first time. And yes. that's kind of changed her whole life. Ever yes. since then. And it's just like the human need to have connections with people you know, and here she was in and out of foster care system and finally met this person, you know, at 27 years old and her life changed after, after that. So it was amazing to see how much just love, you know, was the key thing to change her whole life. Correct. In fact, some ways of looking at therapy is it's just if we can get people healthy enough to then have a real connection, real Absolutely. love out there. Absolutely. There was a wonderful movie many years ago, let me just finish that because I want to hear, um, called Educating Rita, Michael Caine and somebody else. So he's an alcoholic professor, brilliant man, but just like cynical at this point, burned out. And she's a hairdresser, feels like she's a dummy, but loves the literature and thinks a literature professor. So she takes his class and she's in awe of him. And he's in awe of her. She's so enthusiastic and so reflexively, intuitively bright and blah, blah, blah. And eventually what happens is they each learn to accept the truth the other has about them. So he eventually sees that he is a brilliant man and that literature is a wonderful thing and his, that he does, he rediscovers his passion. And she eventually sees that she's not just some dumb hairdresser, that she internalizes his version of who she is, that truth. And in some ways, good therapy is that, is accepting the tr other truths about us those parts that are hidden way down. And then, because in many ways, in many ways, identity is destiny. We have a very hard time allowing ourselves to be treated outside of the parameter of what we believe our value valence is. So the classic person who's been beaten as a kid and all that, and you know, alcoholic father beater, and picks an alcoholic husband or partner, and the people who treat her nicer, either I wouldn't have a club that would have me. I can't believe their version of me. It's very hard to accept a new version of me. Um, or they're boring. They discount it. And they only grab the person. It's a repetition, compulsion. Magic child thinks if I get you to love me instead of beat me, I get dad to love me instead of beat me. The other part of it is how to not carry out a negative version of self. Another footnote on that is Tom Rusk, my dear buddy, who is in the uh, first part of your compendium, the thing on spiritual parenting. He worked with very <coughs> richy folk. And he worked with one guy who just got the governor's award for best lawyer in the state or whatever it was. He went in during the ceremony, went in the back, it was at a courthouse, and he stole something from the judge's chamber, like a ruler or something. Why? Because he couldn't tolerate being treated so incongruently with how he saw himself. And it's like he had to prove to himself that it really is just a smirk, Troy. It's amazing. You had a thought or comment, please. Yeah, it was just like a de deja vu experience that you were talking about after class last week. I had an interview at Juvenile Hall, and we spent probably a good 15, 20 minutes talking about connectedness and cool. the adolescents that they serve cool. because a lot of them are in trouble and mm -hmm. spending time in, in jail. and how they don't have that connectedness at home, and if they do, it's in a gang, and it was just like day job. <laughs> the universe is telling you that this really is important. Listen. Okay, gosh, yes, cool. Um, there was a nice, again, the Academy Awards for a second. There was a nice comment they showed. I think it was one sequence in the life of Pi. At the end, when he's an adult again being interviewed, I don't know if you saw the movie. Anyway, he said, you know, you know the story basically is with this tiger and some metaphor or whatever. And he said the hardest thing is not getting to say goodbye. When the tiger, you know, they go through all this and the tiger just walks into the forest and leaves at the end there. And that is so true in connection. When you don't get to say goodbye, it feels so unfinished. And notice, by the way, that usually when you leave a person, you usually don't say goodbye. See ya, hey, I'll catch ya. It's very hard for us because, of course, the hauntingness of the flip side of connection is disconnection. 
And we don't, and we're scared of that. The greatest fear is abandonment, ergo death, which is in some sense for those who don't believe in afterlife, the ultimate abandonment. And we, we have a very hard time just saying, goodbye, see ya, catch you later. It's ways of saying we're not really disconnected. Okay, okay. Um, the other one, with the, the couple other things in that. The end of Beasts of the Southern Wild, for those who saw that. Her line is that she, she is leaving something so that archaeologists or something thousands of years from now will know that once upon a time there was a hush puppy, that's what her dad called her, who lived with her father in the bathtub, which is what that area was called. And again, it's the longing to have been, to be connected forevermore to the future, that just the thought that somebody will see this of me and know I existed. And Tarantino, when he did his acceptance speech, I don't know if you noticed that, he got for, I guess, screenplay, he wrote the screen. He, he thanked his actors for carrying out these characters in such a vivid and live way so they would live on. So that 50 years from now, if somebody saw this movie, they would, he didn't use this term, but basically connect. So that he can connect to a future beingness and exist by the fact that somebody sees his movie, is moved by the character, knows he's there. Okay? It's just, it's amazing. If you start looking at that, you'll see that it's really the underlying fabric to everything. Um, a deaf person will walk all day, will walk all day long to find one other human being they can sign. Mm -hmm. All day long, just for some communication of connection. Love plus connection equal, equals, remember? Bliss. Bliss, very good. Love without connection is? Okay. Agony. Because love doesn't necessarily mean connection. We love a lot of folk that at any given moment we don't really feel all that connected to. A lot of times like our parents. We love them dearly, but we don't necessarily feel connected. And connection is a constant dance, constant dance. And as I said, everything we do in one sense brings us closer, the same, or farther away in any given moment. How to be choiceful around that. If you take kids, you come into, if we went to the elementary school over there, middle school, and with a box of yellow t-shirts and a box of blue t-shirts, and we have half the class just put on the yellow t-shirts, half the blue, within an hour, they're going to more likely describe their fellow yellowers in more positive terms than the bluers. Just like that. We'll now make a connection here. If I divide you guys up into three groups, and I'm going to ask you to spend 50 minutes creating a culture Okay, a universe, your own little country, culture, beingness. Okay, what are the rules? What are the expectations, etc.? Remember, by the way, culture is the way we, in fact, define through rituals and rules and um, a whole bunch of other artifacts, ways of being that define our connection. So, if I have you guys do that into three different groups, okay, and at the end of the 50 minutes, I say, here's the following. Let's imagine that space aliens are going to come down, okay? And you three distinguished groups have to come together, have to form one cohesive group. So you're going to have to compromise on your culture that you've created and whatnot. And if you don't, Earth is going to be destroyed and all, all the culture will be destroyed. More often than not, you would rather be destroyed then have to give up the culture you've created. It's amazing how we will grab on. Well, that just speaks to like what's going on in the world today. Correct. I mean, <laughs> it's Correct. obvious that you know there's conflict because Correct. of different cultures and Correct. beliefs and different values. Correct. And the substandard underneath all that is our need to connect and define our connection in these very narrow ways. And it's harder to expand our sense of connectedness in as much broader ways. Okay. I show you this picture because Duran Volcani texted me this picture. No words, no nothing, just this picture. You can't see it all that well. There's that black rab, Toyota rab, with a license plate, surf sub. I looked at that picture and I immediately got teary-eyed and my heart filled, filled 
That's an example of what? That's too broad a question, in a way. It's an example of a schema. To you, I mean, it's just a parking lot and some cars and whatever. There's no, I don't think, as much of any emotion in that at all. Because you don't have a schema. You have a schema for car, for um, parking lot. You have a schema is why you can sit in that chair. Because you have a schema of what a chair is, why you can use that pen, etc., etc. But schemas that have emotional valences are enormously powerful. The reason I have such a feeling about that parking lot is because that's the parking lot for Rincon. Rincon is that magical surf spot on the county line between Santa Barbara and Ventura. And I know it so well, all I have to do is see that. Even now, I look at that picture, I know exactly, and all this smells. I know that you walk down that path and you go around the bend, every good, never mind fabulous surfer in this world, every fabulous surfer that's ever existed since 1950-something has gone down that exact path to those waves that are right around the bend that are unbelievable. I told you, it's worth, it's, a, it's about a three hour drive, three and a half hour drive, depending on traffic. I could drive all the way up there, catch one Rincon wave to myself, and drive all the way back, smile on my face the entire time. I was 16 years old. It's the first time ever my mom and dad, it was a Wednesday night, I was a senior. No, I think I was a junior, I was a junior. Mom and dad are leaving. Dad had a convention thing, something, a, a seminar uh, in Monterey. So mom says, honey, here are the cures of the Rambler. 64 Rambler. Take it to school. Want to go surf down the shores? No problem. We're going to be back tomorrow. So, you know, we'll see you then. There was this fantastic northwest swell sweeping the coastline. And I knew Rincon was going to be on fire. And I knew if I could go on a Thursday morning to surf Rincon during a school week, I'm likely to get it really good with very few people out. Wednesday, right after school, I pack that car. I put the board on it. Before leaving the house, I write the following note. Dear Mom and Dad, this is your former son. I know I'm going to get caught because you're going to be home before I am. I'm in Santa Barbara surfing Rincon. Do whatever you will to me. It's worth it. Love your former son, you're not. <laughs> well, I thought they were going to just go bomb. I can't believe. I mean, the one time to finally trust me, it's like risky business, right? You throw the party, whatever. That was a sudden movie. I go to Rink, I spend the night at the railroad tracks. Wow. This is railroad really tracks. Right? That's one of the cool things about Rincon. This train goes by. Ooh, oh, it's unbelievable. It's so mythic. I woke up that morning. It was perfect. There was one other guy out. It's me and one, something like a terrier. It's me and one other person surfing Rincon. I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. The set comes, he gets the first wave. I have a choice of three different Rincon waves. I let him, two of them pass by, I take the third one. And within about an hour and a half, the wind came up, it got choppy. Locusts, as in crowds, came down to descend on this spot. Probably 50 people out within a matter of <laughs> 10 minutes. I left, ear to ear grin. My mom did not say much. Years later, she says, do you know when I knew you were going to be just fine in life? Huh? When you went to Rincon. Because it was so important to you. You didn't lie about it. You were willing to take whatever consequence because it was that important to you. She's being a tradeologist in that moment, really. And saying that trait of you, that spunk that said, this is important to me. I'm willing to take the consequence. It's that important. It's really cool. Cool. So that's why that's important, because there's schemas. OK, so we talked about schema of self. I guess I can turn this off now. Um, if I just close this, will it turn off, or I have to shut it down? Oh, you want your computer back anyway. You can have your computer back. Okay. And I can close this. Yes. How we take it back to your thing? Well, you can. Yeah, you can. <sighs> Let's do that. Gave for your assertive part that asked for what you need. <laughs> That's true. Do you know the most popular um, Super Bowl ad? This past Super Bowl, you know, they now have this, it's a whole thing. It's, just, it's as big as the Super Bowl itself, if not bigger in ways. Yes. So here we have 
Correct. And what's the underlying theme of that horse ad? You betcha. So here it is. Here's, I mean, let's face it. There's a lot of sexy ads, man. What's sex, by the way? Connection. At least good sex is connection. <laughs> right? Siggy's big thing. Two main drives. Sex. And what's the other big drive for, for S and A? What's the A for Siggy? Aggression. And what is aggression? When we're disconnected and we're pissed off about it and we want to get reconnected and force the person to reconnect in a certain way. So what he's really talking about, the most important dimensions, even thank you Sigmund Freud, is connection and disconnection. So with all those ads, with all that sex, with all that cleverness, with all that wit and all that stuff and the millions of dollars they spend, what's the ad that's by far, and I don't know what the ratio was, but by far the most popular was the guy and the horse, a little cold, who then grows up to be the... Ah, oh, you just think about it, you get teary-eyed. Because connection. <laughs> By the way, there's a, there is a, you know, 15 minutes of fame. So this high housewife, I think she's a housewife, wonders what makes good marriages, like all the rest of us wondered. So she gets together with some researcher and gets over 100,000 couples that are real happy and writes a book called The Normal Bar. And of course, the number one thing that, can, that predicts Happiness in couples is good communication, which of course is connection. Though, as a marriage therapist, remember, what's the 69%? Unresolvable conflict. Helping them communicate, communicate about it isn't going to resolve it. But if you can get compassion and wit, they can still be very connected, even in the areas where there are unresolved differences. Because those beliefs hit core schemas. So the most important scheme, or at least a very important scheme, is the scheme of self. And I was using the analogy right, Ramachandram's body schema that we have a self schema that starts very early. And your self schema has two main components. It does have a left brain verbal component. If I asked you to verbally describe yourself or write down five or ten traits that you or your best friends would describe you as being, what would be one? Trait. Driven. driven. She's driven. Tenacious and motivated. And right. That's a left brain component. You can say it. Well, you also have, and perhaps almost more importantly, a right brain component to your self schema. When again, we were talking about identity as destiny, we're really talking about the right brain component. Let me give you a couple of things about the right brain. So I show you a, I, I show through your right eye to your left brain a picture of Churchill. And I ask you, what'd you see? And you'll say, Churchill. Or if you don't remember your history, some kind of grumpy, <laughs> jowly old man. Okay, fair enough. Now, through your left eye to your right brain, I show you a picture of Beyonce you will not be able to tell me who you saw. It's not connected to your verbal areas. However, if I later on say, put five pictures here, not Churchill, four of them you hadn't, I hadn't shown you, and I include Beyonce, I'll say, pick the picture I showed you. You will invariably pick Beyonce. Anybody see 50 First Dates? Right. So she has a, learning, a memory deficit disorder. She can only remember for about 12 hours and 24 hours, and then she's totally forgotten. There are folks with that kind of disorder. So, of course, she and Adam Sandler have a relationship, and they fall in love, and he's, <laughs> she doesn't remember him the next day, so they keep having these first dates and blah, blah. Well, like any good love story, chick flick or otherwise, Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they fall in love, then there's the conflict, they break up, then they get back together. Again, connection, disconnection, reconnection, we love that. There's a, there's a, a scene, which is just fabulous, where they, so now they're broken up, she's mad at him, she doesn't remember him, right? She's a painter, among other things, and she's like in this, I don't know, painting ashram or something, I don't remember that well, but she's painting away every day, blah, blah. He comes to the ashram. She looks at him. She doesn't know who he is. But then they show her paintings, and who has she been painting? Him! His face the whole time. Because the unthought known. 
she knows him in areas of the brain that she doesn't know she knows him. Okay, so now it gets more interesting. The chicken and the snow mound. So I take a picture of his chicken. And through your right eye to your left brain, I show it. And I ask you what you saw, and you'll say, I saw a chicken. Right. I now show you a picture of a snow mound. Through your left eye to your right nonverbal brain. You will not be able to tell me what you saw. Okay. Now I put five little objects in front of you. And I'll say, please pick the object that has to do with the picture you saw. And the only object that has anything to do with the picture you saw is a little miniature snow shovel. Okay, remember, you can't say that you saw the snow mound. You can say that you saw the chicken. But now it's a snow shovel. You will invariably pick the snow shovel. You will. You won't know why. When you're asked, why did you pick this and that? That's interesting. Why did you pick that? The example the researchers gave is the, the subject said, in order to pick up the chicken poop. <laughs> now, think about that. That's fabulous because that's 98.3, again, made up number, percent of the time of what we're doing. It has nothing to do with why you picked that, but you absolutely believe it is because your brain has a need to rationalize and justify your experience and labelize it. And a lot of the time, it's erroneously labelizing. It's a whole other reason. It's a right brain, deep right brain reason why we do most of why we do. But we'll give a left brain justification for it. Because we need to do that to justify what we're doing. And that's why you're not likely to turn a liberal Democrat into a right wing Republican or a right wing Republican into a liberal Democrat, no matter how much left brain information you're going to give them. And you're not going to change a Catholic to a Jew and a Jew to a Catholic and a Muslim, but there will be, no matter how much left brain information. But don't you see? But don't you see? It has nothing to do with what I see or don't see. I picked up this because I picked up the snow shovel because it's actually to pick up the chicken poop. No, it has nothing to do with that. Okay? It's a really important principle. I and mean, when you watch couples argue, again, that has to do with the unresolvable. You're not going to resolve it with that, but they'll try. Because your amygdala starts to fire, and then what do you do? You, right? You get defensive, you get critical, you get contemptuous, or you just avoid. I've also seen people get overwhelmed. Oh, God, I can't believe it. And in a way, that freaks the other person out, and it kind of shuts down the argument. It's another way to try to influence. OK. I gave you that formula. Contentment is talent plus effort plus some product plus recognition. Of course, the recognition component really has to do with connection. So your contentment is based on somehow you connect. Okay, when you shift, you're shifting the right brain part. You shift the right, you shift this unthought known. That's why it's so contagious. It's not about the left brain attitude or, or, or ideas. You don't shift ideas, you shift feeling states, you shift schema states. That's what shifts. And it's important to know that because that's the power of it. Right. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, you're getting all this. It's kind of straightforward, yes? We're good, we're good, we're good. <sighs> Guardian neighbor. By the way, there's religious references. Again, I'm not trying to proselytize anything other than how important connection is. <sighs> When I was growing up, my mother was a janitor in a Catholic hospital, and when they were tearing down a wing where the nuns used to live, they tossed out some pictures in frames. Mom brought one home, a print of a boy and a girl, barefoot and frightened, and crossing a bridge at night. Behind them flew an incredibly gorgeous angel looking just like Beyonce, with huge wings and a different hairdo and the most understanding look on her face. My brother and I couldn't believe it our own picture of the guardian angel, formerly owned by actual nuns. The idea of protection was a big deal to us. Michael needed her to balance out his taped up picture of Alfred E. Newman 
from Mad Magazine, whom he had worshipped but never really trusted since the day he got a high fever and saw Alfred's lips moving. <laughs> I wanted protection because things hadn't gone so well in our household lately. My father made a bedroom for himself in the basement. I knew it meant something, and I knew that it wasn't good. We heard a lot about guardian angels from our Auntie Elizabeth, who was from the Philippines and knew a tremendous amount about the social structure of heaven and also about the lives of movie stars, the virtues of nail polish, and the tricky waves of the wild Filipino vampires who could make blood suddenly shoot out of anything. As far as I could tell, my guardian angel never hated me once for being bad. She couldn't afford to because she was stuck with me for the rest of my life. When I got in trouble, I imagined she could explain my side of the story to God, who was usually so busy that he only showed up when something really bad happened, like the time I broke my brother's collarbone after I pushed his go-kart a little too hard. I, my guardian angel would say, oh, Lord, she's just a kid. I mean, haven't you ever pushed a go-kart too hard by accident? Shoot, I know I have. And the night my father didn't come home and my mother cried in the kitchen until morning, I believed my guardian angel could explain God's side of the story to me. Don't even worry, because God may be busy, but he's not cruddy, and something is bound to happen that will make everything okay. Now, I grew up in the last street before a garbage ravine, where people from other places drove up to dump old refrigerators and mattresses and bodies of dogs and other trash. My parents needed a place quick, and a real estate man directed us to a rundown house with broken windows and a yard full of sticker bushes. I remember our first night perfectly. My brother and I screamed when we turned on the faucet because the water came out thick with rust. And we were sure it was the blood, the sign of the wild Filipino vampires. You can bet that like most kids in disintegrating situations, we needed a guardian angel. She came knocking on our back door the next morning, Mrs. Yvonne Taylor, with a welcome cake in her hands and her sons, JJ and Sammy, peeking at us from behind her legs. See, she had dark hair in a bun and pointed glasses, and she was married to a black man, a white woman married to a black man with two kids to prove they really meant business. I knew right away there was something different about her. It was a look she had when you talked to her that we had hardly ever seen on an adult. She looked like she was actually paying attention. I soon followed the lead of other kids who had a ritual for visiting Mrs. Taylor. See, first you stole flowers from someone's yard. Then you hid them behind your back, walked into Mrs. Taylor's, and stood around like you weren't doing any big thing. When you whipped out the flowers, she acted like she had never seen anything so beautiful in all her life. Even if you were handing her yanked up plants with dirt clods hanging off of them, she still would say, well, bless you. And she put her arms around you and held you tight. Most of the kids on my street saw things like this on TV or read about it at school. But for the most part, it seemed like a lost practice from an ancient tribe. Almost all of us had parents who were deep in various sorts of trouble, and they just could not remember how to do this anymore. Mrs. Taylor was about the only remaining evidence of purely affectionate contact for no good reason between adult and child. And I have no doubt that a lot of credit for the sanity of the kids who grew up in my neighborhood is due to her. One day I asked Mrs. Taylor if I could go with her to the church she attends. Morning Star Congregation was a Baptist church in an old store. Couldn't believe it was even a church because of the hanging light bulbs and the beat up chairs and the actual scotch tape on the picture of Jesus. Also, people were talking pretty loud and they were laughing. Then, it, then the service began. And this choir that it felt, I felt sorry for because it had only nine people and the robes didn't match started singing and moving sideways back and forth. And then this really regular looking teenager with blue plastic headbands stepped forward and the whole congregation started shouting, yes, tell us about it, yes. She looked so normal and this voice as good as a record was coming out of her mouth. She started going faster and faster until she jumped and pure music shot out of her mouth like light, like wild electricity, jumping free of the wires and shooting into people who leapt up shouting, thank you, thank you, yes. And tears were coming down their faces and suddenly it got me. It got me lifting and holding and shaking me in the most powerful, beautiful, terrifying way. I didn't know what happened, 
But for years after that, I could not sing or listen to live singing without crying, even if it was Farmer in the Dell. No music ever sounded the same after that, because I could always feel it like it was touching me. We invented a game called Church in Mrs. Taylor's front room, who dragged out her huge Bible, turned and took turns playing the preacher, the lead singer, and the lady whose wig was on crooked by the end of the song. And the greatest part was Mrs. Taylor leaning out of the kitchen to tell us that our sins had been washed off of us, and they were lying all over the floor, so somebody please back in. I loved going to her house so much that one day I sneaked over at dawn. I stood on her porch knocking and knocking and knocking, weighing how much of a bother I was becoming against how badly I needed to see her. Finally, the door opened. Mr. Taylor in his bathrobe looked down and said, well, girl, what are you doing here? Mrs. Taylor stepped out from behind him with her robe on, and for the first time ever, I saw her long hair down. The whole picture of it made me unable to speak. Mr. Taylor was getting up for work anyway, and Mrs. Taylor was making him breakfast. When I told her my mom and I could eat with them, she laughed and pushed the screen door open. I will never forget that morning, sitting at their table, eating eggs and toast, watching them talk to each other and smile. How Mr. Taylor made a joke and Mrs. Taylor laughed. How she put her hand on his shoulder as she poured co coffee and how he leaned his face down to kiss it. And that was all I needed to see. I only needed to see it once to be able to believe for the rest of my life that happiness between two people can exist. And I remember Sammy walking in and crawling onto his father's lap, leaning his head into his dad's green overalls, like doing this was the most ordinary thing in the world. Even if it wasn't happening in my house, I knew that just being near it counted for something. When I got back home, my mother told me she was ready to wring my neck. She couldn't figure out why in the world I kept going over there to bother those people. When Morningstar needed a new sign, it was Mrs. Taylor who painted it. I watched her leaning with a brush over the painted plywood, drawing the shining lights around the crosses. By then, I'd already known her secret. I need to tell you something about Mrs. Taylor, my mom said once in a very serious voice. But first, you have to promise never to tell anyone, OK? I nodded. Mrs. Taylor, my mom said, is an artist. I could tell from the way she said the word it was supposed to be pretty bad news, but I just couldn't figure out how. After that, I looked at the different pictures on Mrs. Taylor's walls, thinking, oh, that one of the mill by the river? Ah, she painted that. And the, and the one of those guys eating with Jesus, the Last Supper, uh, I bet she painted that one too. As I watched her letter that sign so perfectly, I remember thinking that word, artist. And when she let me make one of the shining lines off the cross, I made a vow in my head that that was what I was going to be. I vowed that I was going to grow up and be great at it. I was going to do something like make an incredibly gorgeous picture of her to hang where everyone in the world could see it so they could know how great she was. I never did tell anyone her secret. For 27 years, I didn't breathe a word. But now, I think it's finally OK to go ahead and spill the beans. Linda Berry is an artist and writer. Her first play, The Good Times of Killing Me, opened in New York City. Why did I read you this? Why did I read you that? You can make a difference. You as an individual, you as one person in this little pumpkin's life, that you see once every 45 minutes, every week, once a week for 45 minutes, every other week. You, 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 can, you can make a difference in the child's life. You can be a guardian therapist. You can be Mrs. Yvonne Taylor in their lives. You, influ you influence a life through connection, that lost, practice from an ancient tribe, she looked at us as if she was really 
listening. You as an individual therapist can do that. You can be, that's why I teach this class, because I really believe you as an individual play therapist can make a difference. As she did, I love that story. Okay. Let me say a couple before we go to that. Say a couple things. There are many types of connections that we have. Context makes a huge difference. You guys are connected by the context of this, of being in this, of this process in your lives, of going through graduate school. We're connected because we're in this class together. You be, you, I'm connected to my, I went to my 40 year high school reunion. It was the weirdest thing. I felt so connected to those people, even though I had, I, well, most of them I wouldn't even recognize on the street. But because of the context we were in, there's a connection that's there. Soldiers have a really hard time, a lot of them, as you know, coming back. And a lot of factors involved. We see horrible things, there's trauma. A lot of the trauma, by the way, is not so much what happened to them, but what they ended up doing to others. That's really traumatic. But it's also very hard, once you have that kind of connection in that kind of context, to feel that same connection with anybody else. That's a horrible discovery. You finally come home, you've been waiting all this time to your dear loved ones that you really do love and you feel so disconnected. There's a very high suicide rate. More soldiers die of suicide than of warfare. Remember the root of suicide is feeling utterly and totally disconnected. You don't want to be dead, you just can't stand being alive in that much pain because we are creatures of connection. The brightest client I ever saw, she was a poet, she was an artist, she was unbelievably cultured. She had a traumatic event where she was held hostage by an individual in a room and was basically tortured for basically all day. And given how she and who she was, she managed to eventually, he left and he let her go. She never recovered from that event because in a bizarre, horrific way, she felt he knew her. And in a sense, she was more connected to him in that particular regard than anybody else, because nobody ever seen her under those conditions in that situation, in that context. And it was so perverse to her to, in this weird way, feel known by this horrendous individual. She could not refine meaning in life, and she eventually killed herself, because she couldn't stand that disconnection from anybody else. Context has a huge impact. So you create in your individual therapy a very unique and special context. We missed a couple of powerful stories. But I, no, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll tell you briefly at the end. So, under what conditions why would you do individual play therapy? You're going to do individual play therapy because you're going to create this context, a safe and sheltered space to express and explore with the potential to resolve who you are. You're the, um, the uh, assessor at the clinic. What criteria points are you going to utilize to say, okay, this kid could benefit by individual play therapy? Under what conditions? What are you going to say? What kinds of kids? Somebody seen kids? Somebody seen kids, yes? At this point, no? Anybody seen kids? 
okay, what kinds of kids? Under what condition do you see kids? Individual play therapy. I would say to create performance. Okay, but I mean, but what, what are the issues or diagnostic categories or? Oh, young children. Yeah, young children. You're talking about zero to eight, zero to six, that kind of thing. What, what are the criteria? Why do you see them in individual therapy? Behavior issues. Okay, so they act out behavioral issues. That's a big part of it, particularly boys. You're going to have anxiety. There are kids, honest to God, anxiety. Trauma? You betcha. <laughs> By the way, we also have kids who have depression. And certainly trauma. Sometimes the anxiety and or depression is specifically related, or the symptoms of that depression, the trauma, come out in anxiety and depression. Sometimes not. They're just a little amygdalites. You know, amygdala is constantly fine for no apparent reason. High sensitivity quotient. Remember the SQ, that formula? And there's ne neurobiological substrates to that high sensitivity, remember? Genetic substrates. Trauma. So you got the usual child abuse types of trauma. Um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, etc. You have traumatic environments like alcoholic, substance abusing parents. You have traumatic events. Sorry? You betcha. I was getting to that. Drum roll. Very good. You betcha. 50% rate or something like that in the state of California? That's a lot of kids impacted. And you have things like car crashes or family member dies or, you know, life. The exigencies of existence and beyond just existencies, really difficult things. Accidents, illnesses. I'm working right now with a marvelous old pumpkin who had a very significant cancer. And it's, she's in remission, but she gets checked every month. It's a virulent, dangerous cancer, yes. Vicarious trauma, like witnessing DV. You betcha. And that's why DV is considered child abuse. Even if you're not eating the kid. And they all say, well, they didn't see it. They were in the room. You know, in the other room, upstairs. Oh, yeah. The walls are shaking and they're screaming. And, oh, right. They didn't see it. I'm a parent coordinator on a case where a man, you know about parent coordinator, right? It's a very important role. Very, very quickly. Courts don't know what to do in all these high conflict divorces. He said, she said, and all this stuff. Or even if they find, okay, you're an alcoholic, you need treatment. Who's going to follow up and see to it that they actually get the treatment? Can't keep coming back to court. It's not going to be the attorneys who do that. So in the last couple of years, this role called parent coordinator has been developed. It's not a mediator. Mediator helps people come up with a parenting plan. Parent coordinator helps them carry it out and follow the court orders. So you're in the, in the family's life till the kids are 18 and bye-bye. You're a part of their life. Now, hopefully you see them very rarely because they move along. But some folks, you've got to make sure the drug tests are happening and you get the report that says, yeah, it's a clean test. And if not, you have, oh my God, decision-making power. You can say, oh, visitation is stop right now until you get a clean drug test. And by the way, now we're back to supervised visits. You have a lot of power, potentially. They can always take it back to court you're not the judge. Very different role. This guy had an alcohol problem. He fessed up to it. I said, supervise visits, etc. Until you start working a program and all that stuff and blah, blah. He is. Things were getting a lot better. The mom's saying it's a lot better. All of a sudden, he comes to their door two weeks ago and smashes on the door, screaming, yelling, etc., etc. Out of the blue. The good news, bad news is he was totally sober. He was really proud of that. Uh, yeah, that's great. On the other hand, dude, you're doing that. Why? Now, I am not, so I saw him just two nights ago. Because, of course, he wants everything back on. I'm like, whoa, I'm glad you're working your program. There's a, I'm not your therapist. You have a therapist. You have a psychiatrist. You have a whole team. I'm part of this team. But I got to tell you, there's a part of you that you are not in charge of. He ended up naming that part Attila. I said, very good. Until that's excellent. That's the first step to getting in charge of Attila, is that you name it and realize it's an external part. But that part's going to come and smash, crash down. And 
that impacted your little pumpkin point of all this, who's on the other side of that door. Because he wants his visits, everything restored. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not the child's individual therapist. She doesn't need an individual therapist. Well, the mom sure thinks so. Because the mom was on the other side of that door. As you're screaming and yelling, Attila or whoever you want to call it, screaming, yelling, pounding. And your little pumpkin is hearing daddy scream, yell, pound, terrified that you're going to come in. And she's seeing mommy freaking out. And her brother, stepson, freaking out. Whoa. Oh, I don't think that that's bad. That's a problem that you don't think that that's not bad. I am not your therapist. Go talk to your therapist about how, what, how that impacted this little child. DB impacts the kids enormously. And he goes into, well, are you saying I'm never going to see her? I said, that is limbic logic. Whenever you say the word never, always, and you hear anybody else, know immediately your amygdala is firing. Can I'm not a therapist? I'm going to tell you this, though. And know that you're in limbic logic. Prefrontal cortex needs to be in charge. By the way, know that. The limbic will define and will defy the logic. That's why you say, oh, this is to pick up the chicken poop. Because the limbic is defining and defying the logic. So you betcha, DV, those little pumpkins, need to be an individual play therapy, I believe, at least until we are six. Along with, I'm not saying you can't do family therapies and a whole bunch of other interventions. Of course you can. But one intervention that's going to be really important for that little pumpkin Pumpkin is called individual play therapy. And we'll talk a lot about why play therapy. We'll get to that as they're little. Remember, remember? You are the mosaic of your attachments. You tell me what you're attached to, you're defining who you are. Okay? When you're a little pumpkin, one way to look at development is what are you attached to? At what stage of the game, what are you attached to? When you're a little, little, little pumpkin, little Jan, or big Jan, rather, who just sits here, is at home right now, because her little, little, little pumpkin is attached to whom? Mom. In fact, she doesn't know any difference between mom and her. Remember the first two months, all your senses are not separated? She sees, feels, hears, smells, touches mom, caregiver, being Absolutely. Oh, where's that quote? I gotta find you this quote. This is too important. Oh, it's such a cool quote. It's out of a uh, Spielberg movie called Super 8. And I'm gonna find you this quote. It's just too good. Is that really good? I just saw it. You did just see it. Then you'll recognize this quote. Um, <sighs> It's just too good. Sorry that it's... That would be good. It's, it's, what'd you think? Did you like it? Interesting movie? Good effects. Good story. Good story. Good effects. This one scene... Uh, <laughs> By the way, the reason we hate betrayal so much... I just see this in my notes. Because it's a disconnect. Right? Our loved one now disconnects with us. And it's in an unfair fashion. She's not supposed to, he's not supposed to do that. Remember the fairness issue, because fairness is related to predictability, which is our whole brain is set up to do. So it hits both those things. It's not fair, and you disconnect it. Oh, schmirks. It's overwhelming for us. <laughs> Here it is. You ready for this quote? God, I love this quote. So there's a scene, you'll remember, right? This kid, he's a cutie pie, and he has this crush on this girl. He, his mom died, right? Isn't she died? Yeah, mom died. She's raised by dad. This is kind of a subplot because it's not really what this thing's focused on. But at one point, he's showing a video to this little girl of his mom, tape of the mom. And then he says, she used to look at me this way, like really look, and I just knew I was there, that I existed. Perfect. Steven, you got it. Perfect. There is no me without a we. 
And when your Jan's little daughter, I think it's the daughter, we know, I don't, boy, it's a little boy, sorry, boy. Do we know his name? Kenji. Kenji. Little Kenji does not even know there's anything close to a me. It's all we. We, we, we. And it's all about how they are now holding, smelling, looking at it. Remember the twinkle in the eye? Remember why? The surface area, right? Pupil dilates, tear ducts release, shiny eye. They're looking at you. The oxytocin looks unbelievable what happens. So one way to define development is what you're attached to at what stage. And so when you're this stage of the game, you're attached to mommy, daddy, family, all this. And it gets to expand, 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 expand. Right? Eventually it's, first it's we, me, then it's we, me. Eventually it moves into me, we. And me, not we, when you're an adolescent, and eventually me and we. And you can define all disorders from borderline, narcissist, whatever you want, to that continuum. Because health is defined by the ability to be a we, 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 monsieur, and a me. If you're a narcissist, it's me, 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 very little we. <laughs> and if you're dependent personality or whatever, I'll call dependent, blah, 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 sorry, it's all we, 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 we. And if you're borderline, who are we? Who are me? Who are we? Who are me? Oh my God. And they shift that right brain state so you're in that same state. We, me, we, me, oh my God. So you get anxious. You get mad. You get depressed. You get elated. Oh my God. Really important. Divorce. It's a shattering of a we. Because one of the huge definers of self that we are very attached to is called family. Family. I mean, if we, I remember, I remember this beautiful, I first come to the States, right, and I'm seven-ish, and I remember going, I'm, we, we arrive at New York City, and we go to this big department store, and we're like, oh my God, it's a huge place. And we bought a sweater, and it was black, and it had turquoise in it and some reddish, and I love this sweater. When you're six, seven years old, you attend, never mind, you've heard my red bike story, you're attached to a sweater. My God, brother, sister, mom, dad, family, that's huge. And we all carry transcultural, transhistorical, transpersonal, archetypal, template, schema of that Norman Rockwellian portrait of family. And yeah, he was a white honky guy. He just painted these white honky families. But the turkey dinner thing with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa on the table, and the, we carry that template. And when that's shattered, that's huge for that we meanness and definition of selfness. So they need a safe and sheltered space to express and explore their thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions to that state with the possibility of resolving it. And they need a person, another. We need a witness to our woes who can resonate and be a psychoanthropologist to connect with us at that primal orbital frontal lobe area so we don't feel disconnected and alone in our aloneness. Okay. So, there you are, thank you. You're going, okay, this kid seems to qualify. You're the intake worker. Kid seems to qualify for individual play therapy, at least as one of the modalities, one of the interventions. All right, we'll go with that. Now, I believe, and I, this is a little bit of a mm, discordant with the current zeitgeist, therapeutic zeitgeist as you well know, managed care and evidence-based therapies. And I'm going to give you articles that show individual play therapy is also an evidence-based therapy, yes! And of course the research is imperfect, as is all research. And cognitive behavioral is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful addition to our worldview. Of course, now we're in mindfulness, which of course is Buddhism. So we kind of come all the way around 2,000 years. Om on the range. I love it. But nonetheless, I think you're saying something if you're really going to take this task on. 
and you're saying, I'm going to be significant in your life. I'm going to be significant. If I'm going to make any real difference in your life, I'm going to be significant in your life. The good news is it's really easy to be significant in little pumpkins' lives because they are just connection mongers. They just want to connect. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, yeah. they, most of them. I mean, some of them are shy and whatever. And they just hide behind, but then you start to make the magic and they're like... And yeah, people have attachment disorders, never mind neurobiological spectrum, autistic spectrum disorder. I understand. They connect to other things as we know it, not necessarily people. They're still connecting. But I'm saying, you're saying, you're going to be significant. Significant in their lives. So here's unpopular number one. I don't care how gifted you are with kids. If you're going to be significant in their lives, you're going to need time. God, that was horrible. I am so sorry. I realized that was recorded. I apologize. Bleep that one out. Or put in, put in Mick instead. Eh? You know? You need time. God, that's terrible. How torturous. You gotta have time. And I know that's incongruent with your lives. Because you have internships. Oh, I mean at least six months, a year. When you're gonna see the Carl tape. By the way, you're gonna see the Carl tape in two weeks. And then kids the following week. Oh my God. Do you feel that? Feel the amygdala happen? Yeah. Well, anxiety. Oh no, oh no, it's okay. We're not on the savannah 30,000 years ago. No saber toothed tiger is about to attack you. I promise. Again, your value as a human being or a therapist or anything else isn't going to be determined by what you do up here with these little pumpkins. When you see the Carl tape, know that. I saw him, oh, within the first two weeks of my block internship at UC Davis. So I had 10 months with this kid. I told him from day one, I'm going to see you for 10 months. And then I'm going to go away. I mean, 10 months, it might have been 10 years, 10 decades. It means nothing to him. It meant something to him when it was 10 weeks left. It meant a lot to him when it was 10 weeks. Or, 10, or we have one more session. That meant a lot to him. But I had time. You've got to have time. And I always say, I just had two new calls yesterday. I said to both of them, I prefer duration over frequency. That is, I would rather see a kid for six months every other week than for three months every week. Because I want to be a part of their lives. And we're still seasonal beings. The savannah still remains. It still whispers in here. So we kind of still think of it like winter. And now we're moving into spring. Never mind all the fashion stuff and whatnot. Spring and summer. And if I'm part of a kid's season, OK? So time. I say about at least six months, preferably a year. I have some kids that I've basically helped truly raise. What a privilege. I have one that <clears throat> by her mom was, uh, had a substance abuse problem. Significant. Grandmother raising this child. Grandmother hears of me, comes to me and says, I want you to help raise this child. You're her therapist, but you're going to be a therapist until she leaves home. That's how we're committed to this. I'm on board. Wow, what a pleasure, what a privilege. And that has been the case. I've seen this child since she was two and a half years old. She is now 15 and a half. I don't see her every week. I now see her once a month. But I am significant. So, and we're gonna, I'm going to keep referring back to her in various times. I have another one. Oh, God, I love this one. I saw her, started seeing her when she was 10. She was a wild child. Spunky, tough ass African American gal. Oh, man. But she had some, I mean, she was using alcohol and stuff at age 10 and 11. She was passed out on the street at age 12 at night and is so lucky that a car didn't run her over and she knows that we referenced that time. She is blooming. She is 21 years old. Yes, college, smart, beautiful, fabulous human being. Fabulous human being. I'm going to get teary yet. I still see her about once a month-ish. Sometimes she doesn't, she'll come in. I am part of her life. So you've got to be what I'm calling available. 
It's different than with adults. You're going to be available. You're going to spend committed time, and you're going to be available. Now, let me be very, 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 very clear. And I've already said this. I think I said this the first day we met, but I'll continue to say it. Never, ever, 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 ever do anything that I'm talking about what I did here, there, or whatever without first checking it out with your supervisor. You're, you're under supervision. Don't go say, oh, well, I did that, so I thought it was a good idea, so I'm going to do it. Don't do that! Let me state the disclaimer. I'm not telling him to do any of these things, Your Honor. You heard it first. Okay? But I'm going to tell you some things I did that's different when you're dealing with the kids than when you're dealing with adults. Huh, I'll tell you this. Anna Freud. Yeah, oh, sehr gut. <laughs> She's the mother of play therapy, of child therapy, really, in many ways. Yay, Siggy, man, at Anna. Really cool. Liebchen. What's your fit? Sorry, I won't even try to do a German accent. That's disgusting. <laughs> What's your favorite food? What do you like? Chocolate chip cookies. Guess what's waiting for Little Pumpkin next session? Anna Freud's chocolate chip cookies. Home baked, warm, fresh from the oven. I mean, these mythologies, I don't know if it's really true or not. Again, I don't know if the pen's going to drop. But that's what I heard. That's what I read. She would actually make them the cookie then. That's not transference. That's mothering. Liebchen, I see you have a hole in your sock. You must be like Volcani. You never wear shoes. <laughs> Take off the sock, and I'll fix it for you. That's not transference. That's parenting. These are kids. These are little pumpkins. Now, I'm going to tell you something right from the start. And, and again, do not do this without permission of your therapist. Hi, Dr. V. Here's what you don't do, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I can see you really would like to hug me, and you perhaps would like me to hug you back. I can understand how you would want to do that, but it's not appropriate in our relationship. What? 5602191, that's called child abuse. That's emotional child abuse. Remember what happens when we're seeking connection that's rejected? Remember what that feeling is? What's that feeling? Yeah. Shame. Shame. Much worse than guilt. Very orbital frontal, very limbic. And what happens if there isn't rapprochement after the sh first shame reaction? What happens next? Humiliation. That's child abuse. Hug the little pumpkin. Not to be gross, and it's probably better if you lean down because if you're a male and they, oh, this isn't, uh, and the parent's right there, and you kind of like it's a little awkward because they're about that size. That happened once to me. The kid just came out of way just bump. I didn't even have time to go down. He's just kind of like, I'm sorry, bait my crotch. And the parent's right there, and I'm right there, and we're all just kind of like, uh, oh, and then I kind of slithered down. But, I didn't, but he was holding me so tight that if he, I tried to slip in, like, it was one of those really weird moments in cycles. But it was just the greeting. I hadn't even opened the door yet to the office. He just glomped on. <laughs> and finally, anyway. It's like at the end of, you've seen Silver Lining playbook. It's like that part, that scene's like, oops, now what do we do? It's a great scene. Anyway, so available. Let me keep giving you some examples of availability. Yeah, hi, hi, yeah, yeah, it's Dr. B, right. Hey, listen, is, is Bethany in? Again, Bethany is like four, five. She's, oh, great. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Notice how you're spilling the song in? Notice that? That's your brain and predictability. You already know the rest of it. Okay. Nowadays, I text for the older, for the teenagers. The, the marvelous, my African-American one, she just had a birthday. I could almost read you the text if it wasn't. It was so wonderful. I text her, happy birthday. Dr. V, thank you for being, I'm going to cry. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for having been there as I grew up. It's been such, and then I, back to her. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege to be in any way a part of your life. Here's the secret, Done, none dare call it love. You love these kids. Not everyone, every time, blah, blah, blah. You are going to love your clients appropriately, responsibly. We'll get into that. 
not counter-transferly, I mean human to human. You connect, you, I love her. I told her that. <gasps> you told her you loved her? Oh my God, what's the number for the licensing board? Oh, they're online, good, we can, we can do it right now. We're gonna report this guy. Of course I told her, in some context that was totally appropriate. I love her. You think she can't see it in my eyes? Appropriately, and we'll get to that. Remember this, Peter. Pita? Sounds like Pita Pan. <laughs> no, Pita. We'll get to that. You, you, you can have to write down. I'll, you'll, you'll see what's an acronym for it. It really is a discern for me. You'll see. Here's another one. Simple. First session. So here's a kid who's elective mute. He is four. Hasn't said a word. He used to talk, had horrible trauma. And now doesn't talk anymore. Okay. It was 12.50. I know exactly. I know why. I was, he was my one o'clock appointment. He comes bounding into the office. At from between 12.50, you know this lifestyle, and one o'clock, I'm eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and this was when I was with good old Tom Rusk, and the office, it was this wonderful Italian deli, just kind of a block and a half away. So I'd go down there, race down there. They all knew me, they already had the sandwich ready. This big sub sandwich. Boom, I bring it out, and I'm just starving. Remember, remember on one hand, remember the burnt bike, and I, I had took it anyway, that's the hard part of me. The other part of me is like, my food, Arr! Three billion years of evolution, like, Arr! I'm back on the savannah 30,000 years ago, my food, Arr! When I used to take food down to the shores where I surf, I'd take a separate thing, because my moochie friend wanted to mooch. Here, you took that, this is mine. Arr! Arr! This little pumpkin comes in. He's standing there. I look at him, and of course, there's food coming out of my thing. I think it's like, you're early. I s looks like you really want part of my sandwich. Absolutely. It was so hard. Here, you take that half, even though it's the bigger half, and I'll take this half. Break bread with me, brother. Become more ritual. We'd go to the deli. He'd get his sandwich, and I'd get mine. Okay? Don't do that with adults. I don't, uh, I've had a couple adults where I'll text them happy birthday. But the ones that I've seen for years. Because I have adults I see for years. The guy I saw last night, I saw him at 8.45 at night until 9.30. The latest I said, this is the latest I've ever stayed. Because I'm committed to this guy. And if he, if he texts me, I see him every once in a while. I said, can I come in really? I said, God, I could stay. And I, he says, if you'd stay, I, I want to come. You're there. Because I love this guy. I've told him I love him. I do love him. He's an adult. I don't go telling everybody on my clients, hey, I love you, man. I love you. Love you. No. It has to be genuine because they'll know if it's not. Okay, some other examples of availability. Ah, my dancer tightrope, roof walker. So I am at CMH doing my uh, postdoc, county mental health inpatient unit, and this 13-year-old dancer comes in. Oh God! I look at her. I go, she's fantastic. I mean, you look at her. She goes, she's a dancer. She's got all those kind of post hippie colors and funny things. Whatever. I do the eval and whatnot, and they sign me as her therapist. Fantastic. We connect deeply. Appropriately. One of the reasons she was in there because she was on top of the roof ready to jump off. Because life wasn't worth living because she wasn't connected to anything and she was very smart and very existential. So we formed this very good bond. I had a picture of a wave, of course, <laughs> on my desk and it was like looking out in the tube, looking out and there was a sun there. It represented hope and all this other stuff. And she looked at that and said, "Is there where where'd you get that? Because I would so want to have that photo. And I said, take the photo. It was just a cutout from a magazine. Take the photo. Transitional object. And she did, because then I started seeing her an outpatient. I saw her for years. She was very shy and whatnot, very self-effacing, self-rebuking, all that stuff, eating disorderish kind of stuff, all that. 
I'm the lead in, a, in the school play. Would you, would you consider coming and seeing the play? Yeah, I came. In the back, saw the play, parents all knew and all that stuff. She went off to college. She would write to me. This is all pre-Skype and all that stuff. She was home for the summer. It was her senior year. She's the lead at a play in Balboa. It's huge. She sent me the reviews. She's fantastic. Would you please come? Of course. And I brought flowers, not red roses. No, some nice bouquet, neutral bouquet. That's availability. That's commitment. That's a type of connection. By the way, on the food thing, I, my, my, my office before the one I had now was above Trattoria Aqua restaurant, which isn't there anymore, and Crab Catcher. Summer at 7.30, windows are open, and we get this wafting <laughs> smells. Oh my God, the guy's like, you know, what's the worst I look like? Hamburger, <laughs> pizza. That looks like a cob salad. I mean, it's all about food, the kid's drooling. He looks at me and says, Doc, I can't talk about anything, I'll think about pizza. I said, me too, let's order. Yeah! I ordered pizza, bring it back up. Only two times I've really eaten with people. You getting the sense of this? Again, do not do anything like any of this. Oh, Carl. Carl. Back to Carl. So I'm leaving in 10 months. So when it comes down to 10 weeks, I say, let me show you. Again, this is way before Google Maps, God knows. It's so much easier now. Let me show you where Michigan is. Let me remind myself. Oh, my God. Here is Sacramento. Here is San Diego. And here, that's how it feels, is Michigan. So in June, after our sessions end, I'm going to San Diego, and I'm going to give you my, your, your parents. My, I'm going to stay with my parents. I'm going to give them my parents' address. Again, no email. This is way, as you'll see when you see the tape, this is ancient. So do you have a way of getting a hold of me? I'll give them even my parents' phone number because you really need to get a hold of me. One of the things you're going to see on this tape is I, I, I keep the camera on and the monitor on, which is unusual. Usually that's disrupted because he had so little sense of beingness, even his body, body boundary. So when he's off camera, where's Carl? Where's Carl? Some object permanence issues here. I even say, here you are. It's as if you aren't existing when you're not in front of the camera. You're right here. Kid of that sort, you're spending all that time connecting, I'm not gonna just vanish. So I'm gonna be here and then I'm gonna go to Michigan. And I'm gonna get there around September. And I'm gonna send you a postcard. Hi, Carl. I'm all the way in Michigan, but you're here in my heart. I'm thinking of you. Christmas, you're gonna get a Christmas card from me. Your birthday is in February. I think it's February 12th, actually. I'm going to send you a birthday card. After that, it'll be up to you whether you want to get a hold of me. But you always can through my parents' address. You can, when you see him, you'll go, huh? Yeah, I get it. He needs to know that he, he exists and you exist when you're not physically there. Pizza. Pain in the ass! I am not doing this for him. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not, I am doing it, but I'm not doing it because I think it's so wonderful that he is... I'm waiting for that postcard from me, that it's, it's about how important I am to him. It's not about that. I am doing it for him, nothing but him. It's a pain in the ass, especially pre-iPhone where I can put it in, remember to send him. Oh my God, I had to remember to do this. I, had to, I, I wrote myself notes, I put it in the car, because I'm traveling across country, I've got to remember to write Carl this card because it's important for him, it's not about me, it's about him, it's therapeutic for him. I can justify it to the board or anybody else. Why would I be doing this? I'll tell you why. It has object relations issues. It's a pain in the ass. Peter, if it's a pain in the ass and you're doing it, probably doing it for the right reason. It's not about you. Redo the tape. It's not about you. It's about them. Okay? Please. So Brian, what, would you, what happens or have you had experiences where you struggled with the time part where it's limited as yeah. far as so many different sessions and you want to, you know, I mean, that can be really challenging and imagine, you know, like, 
just had more time with this kid. And so, like, how do you kind of handle that? Yeah, well, I have to, never mind, expectations, goals, and approaches. And we're going to talk about that, actually. There's, there's kind of broad ways, of, as you well know, of approaching this whole endeavor. And when you don't have the luxury of time, never mind. I don't take insurance payments directly. I take, I'm happy to provide statements. But there are insurance parameters. There's money parameters. There's the parent buy-in parameter. There's all kinds of parameters and, and pragmatics. And I don't get the luxury always of this, of time, and the availability. It, there's other ways in which it comes out, and I'm, so you are available in a certain way. I, I, um, but yeah, time is, is an issue. Other thoughts? Okay, okay. I think the parents have for it. I mean, obviously you have to have some sort of connection with the parent, You betcha. Really important. I make it very, 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 very clear from the very first phone call. And remember what I asked him in the first call, phone call within the first two sentences? Oh, uh, is this an intact family? Oh, you're separate. Oh, you're divorced. What's the next line? Do you have joint legal? Exactly. Is this joint legal? Oh, then I need that. But anyway, once I get past all that, I do say this is a team approach. I will never know your child a millionth as well as you do. You've hired me for my expertise and knowledge. I'm happy to provide it. I'm happy to be able to help I can. Let's you and I meet first. I want to get the background information. And I want to tell you how I work. Now, of course, my website is an ever work in progress. And I need to say put more in there about how I work. But at least there's some sense of how I work. And I'm both relational. I mean, that's, as you well know, that's obviously the core. And I'll say that. So I said that twice yesterday. There is nothing important that's really going to go on without connection to this child. This is my first task and foremost and continual is that this child feels connected to me. Now, by the way, that can be threatening to parents. As much as they want you to have a good report, they don't want, you to, they don't want the kid to love you more than them. I have had not every child every time or anything like that. I remember one kid looked up and said, being here is better than being at Disneyland. True. Oh my God. I mean, think about this. <laughs> you're sitting there in this long line, and here's the goodie, the ride, and you're very little impulse control. You have to sit there, even with a fast pass. Oh my God, that's insane. <laughs> and now your parents stop it, be paying. Oh God. How many existential moments of bliss is there really in that whole enterprise called going to Disneyland? Here's a free and sheltered space where you can think, feel, say anything, and do just about anything. Oh my God, that's about as near to nirvana as you're going to get as a kid. I dare say nobody in this room. I could be wrong. It doesn't mean you're abused, but I would be very surprised if anybody in this room at age 2 to 6 or 8 or 12 or any other time maybe was ever told by an adult, you can think, feel, say absolutely anything and do just about anything. You're the boss in here. You never heard that. It is so incongruent with your experience of adults. And, they, and this person says it with kindness, with, with, with genuineness. And then they start tuning into who you are. Every little move you make, everything. Wow. You bet you this is better than Disneyland. This is as good as it gets. But you have to convince a parent of that. And most of the parents, I mean, I see a, a specific segment of the population. I have a little shishi office, a little boutique in La Jolla, California with an incredible view. It's like a postcard. Literally, you want a postcard of the Cove? Come to my office, take a picture. Unbelievable. You just come for the view. Oh, that's cool. Shut up, Oh, that's a nice view. But, but I'll tell you times as we go along where that, I lost that alliance and I lost the client. Don't forget who your boss is. It is the parent. By the way, think, feel, say, and do anything, you're the boss, until your parents are here. If the parent is here, first of all, ask their, when I do that spiel, I look at the mom, think anything, yes, mom or dad, yes. I have to get sanctified by them. I also make it clear, mom, dad here, they're the boss. Two things on that, and then we're going to take a break. I worked at Southwood Mental Health, right? We saw families, by definition, these families say, you know, we can't take care of the kids, you guys take care of them. Okay, but you still got to empower the parent. Parent comes in. Kids there, parents there. Kids wild. I look at mom. Mom's like, I don't know what to do. I said, it looks like you don't know what to do. Would you like me to help get kid in charge? Yes. I do. I get him in charge and whatever. 
I give her the compliment. Good job. You're my boss. You delegate it to me. I got him to do it. Okay. Next session, they come in. Kids being a bit rambunctious. I look at her. She looks at me. I say to her, this is called Create Realities. You did such a great job last time. I know you can do it this time. She gets up and gets them all in charge. She reframes reality that she did it last time. Mm -hmm. You gotta keep empowering parents. It's amazing. One other scene in a different way. Kid and dad. Kid's about to hit his dad. I go into slow-mo. I grab kid. In all my training from residential centers, I can get a kid <laughs> on the ground in about 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Three seconds. Really? And now we're doing this. I've got my legs wrapped around him, holding this like this. And I got his head like this because they'll do the headbutt. So you got to hold him tight. And we talked about the biting, right? What to do? Oh. And what does the dad do? He gets up from his chair and goes, Thanks! And he's about to slug the kid! He thinks I'm holding him so that he can slug him! And I go, No! And I turn around like this. And I go, Sit down! No, it's not okay to hit him. And I come back around like this. True moment, true moment in therapy. And that's like, and I go, good, just, just breathe. We had to arrange it that they, the kid would take a taxi home. They weren't going to be in the same car. This kid was a teenager. Anyway, stories Jeez. abound. Yeah, all these things you get to look forward to. Go take a break. Come back at 10.30. We will talk more.